Well, I guess we're running. What day is this? March 4th? Mm -hmm. 1989. March 4th, 1989. Okay. Beautiful day in the spring. Yeah. We'll talk about something. Or you want to do it start on me? Yeah, start on you. I was born January the 1st, 1918, on St. Mildred's Court in the front room of a brick house halfway up the block on the west side. The night before, my mother and dad had been to Jackie Coogan in the Kid movie. My grandfather was the doctor in attendance. Is that where you want to start on the scene? Yeah. How did you remember that? Well, you were pretty young at the time, weren't you? I was born very young. But uh, mother and dad rented the place. Dad was working at the time for the, probably for the railroad. And he didn't last long as the railroad. He went to the post office for very long, which no one, none of these jobs paid a whole lot of money back then. They rented a, a small apartment with Mrs. Gentry at the corn, corner of 3rd and Lexington on the north east corner. The house is still there. Then later they bought a house down on South 4th Street right on the south corner of Jacob Street. That house is still there. And we lived there until well, my sister was born there, again in the front room with my grandfather, Dr. Steele, tending to everything. When sis, well, when I was about four years old, we moved to Lexington Street at 320 West Lexington, and we lived there until 1941 when Mother and Dad bought this place here. I left in 1940 and went in the service. Well, first I went in 1940 to live in Tennessee with Guy Jones. His son was, one of my, was my best friend. I lived down there all summer with him, repairing airplanes. We rebuilt an airplane. We have passengers and barnstormed every weekend. It's interesting sleeping under the wing of an airplane, but you sure do sleep with it. It was a very instructive summer. In August, Guy Jr. got his orders to attend flying school. We could see the war coming. And I was unemployed, so I enlisted in August in the Air Force, in the Air Corps, rather, at Fort Knox, August 20th, 1940. And I stayed at Fort Knox with the 12th Observation Squadron for a year. While there, I didn't have two years of college, so I went to night school and studied every chance I got to pass the mental exam to go to flying school, which was a pretty stiff exam. I took it three times before I passed it. The physical exam, I could pass easy enough. When you want something bad enough, you work for it. I went to flying school in August of 1941. I was at Randolph Field, went to Sykeson, Missouri for primary, I went to Randolph Field for basic, and I was at Randolph Field when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. They called us all back to the base, we were not out of uniform anymore after that. They told us that our guns, these infield rifles that we drilled with, were the only air support, air defense that Randolph Field had. And should the Japanese attack Randolph Field, and how they would do that, I don't know. We were to report to the parade ground for instruction. We were to get our rifles, go, go to the supply room and draw ammunition, and then report to the parade ground for further instruction. And I bet there wasn't 10 of us there that could have loaded the infield rifle, but that was the story. We finished our training in an accelerated program. We graduated in March 1942 as, of course, second lieutenant reserve pilots in the U.S. Army Air Corps. Then, I flew observers, we all did, in observer school for three months in their training. After that, we were separated and sent to different bases. I was sent to New Orleans, where I flew submarine patrol for about three months. After that, I was sent to, that was the 113th Observation Squad. After that, uh, two, while I was there, I was made the flight commander of the liaison flight, because we had 30 Cubs, L-4s. Why we had them, I don't know, but nobody wanted to fly them. Well, I thought it was fun, so I built up quite a bit of time on those Cubs. We had a lot of time to spare because we only had six airplanes that were serviceable for our submarine patrol. I was transferred out of there to the 154th Observation Squadron at Winston-Salem, North Carolina. They were on maneuvers. They were preparing to go overseas. We transferred from the whole squadron moved to Charlotte, North Carolina. 
I was one of the first ones that took airplanes to Charlotte. It was in a flight. And the next day, they needed a test pilot to test a P-40, and then we could have it for our squad. I was assigned at that time to a squadron test pilot, which is just a routine thing. I took the airplane up, it checked out perfect until about 300 feet off the ground and it started missing, cutting out, and quit running. I landed in trees and it put me in the hospital for five days, although it didn't interfere too much with my flying because two weeks later I was back flying. In that two week period, my mother and dad came down to visit me. My dad was a reserve officer on active duty. So I had the chance to take him on a trip in an L-1, so one time I ever got him up. The L-1 was a big high-wing airplane. It would fly 25 miles an hour. It would fly to 120. It was a liaison plane and very interesting. The squadron was sent overseas on very short notice. We were alerted for overseas, and all at once, about 9 o'clock one night, the orders came through, you will leave here at 2 o'clock in the morning. They got men in from the picture shows out of town, um, away from their wives, they called everyone in and we all made it. And we were on the plane or the train about two o'clock in the morning and went to Fort, uh, whatever it was, up in New York. We spent the night there to, for some processing, which meant very little sleep. The next night we were taking New York, New York on train to the dock area. We had no idea where we even were. We carried our baggage. We were lined up, we marched off of there, and we marched down on the dock, and we look at the big wall of steel, and it says Queen Mary. On the other side of this pier was the Normandy laying on its side. This is part of history. The Normandy had troubles. They finally ended up dunking up there. We boarded the Queen Mary, and the personnel on there were civilian personnel. They were not military. And we were treated just like we were honored guests. We were signed our food, times, and tables, and we were certainly treated with respect by all the British employees. They knew their business. The next morning we were gathered in the officers, in the lounge, and told the situation, how many lifeboats they had, how many people on board, and they did not have enough life force for all the people on board, but you took your chances. We were at unprotected, with no one around, because the Queen Mary could outrun the submarines. We took a zigzag course and not the gyroscopes that kept the Queen Mary from rocking could not be used. We could not use any personal radio of any type because the Germans may be able to pick it up. There were something like 18,000 men on there. We had a very uneventful trip except on the last day when we picked up our escort and we got up on the tennis deck to watch them after breakfast. And here we were standing up on the tennis deck up on top of the ship and there was a destroyer or a cruiser over on the right side. Even with us, we could see the men if we could have recognized them. And all at once they cut to the left right in front of the Queen Mary and the Queen Mary cut her in two, two-thirds of the way back. We saw the tail part of the ship flip over with men hanging over the rails. We saw the screws and the rudders, and we saw it sink. We saw the front half stay at an angle. They had closed watertight doors, and she floated until certainly she went out of sight from us. Radio silence. The Queen Mary cut loose with those big whistles, and it like to blew us off of there. Ooh, those things were close to us. Later, they had an investigation of it. None of this was publicized. But later they had an investigation of it, and I still don't know the answers from that. I don't think anyone did why they cut in front of it. We were offloaded in Scotland, and then we saw the damage that Queen Mary had to her bow. As we got on the pier in Scotland, we were met by a, sand, a bagpipe band marching up and down in a little skirts swirling around. They met, bid us welcome. From there we were loaded on trains with the private compartments in it. Why we got all this treatment, I don't know. And we were sent to Watersham, England. Of course, we knew not where we were or anything else. We were processed there and told the situation the next day. And that, that next morning, that night, we were welcomed by Lord Haw Haw, who was the German announcer on the German side. And he made us welcome. He called a lot of the squadron officers by name and said he would greet us the next morning. The next morning, a couple of German airplanes flew over, dropped some bombs, and not one of them went off. 
they, I don't know, had been sabotaged or something, but they dropped their bombs and none of them went off. That was a new experience for us. And we grabbed everything we had and we got dressed and we went to the, when the air raid sounded, we went to the basement to the bomb shelters, which had been one of the first things they told us. When we got down there, the British boys were in their underwear laughing at us. They don't take time to get dressed. They just go and we found out that was much better. We were there for about two months or something like that. It ended up that our men were transferred out 10 to 12 at a time, maybe a week or 10 days apart. We didn't know why. We were not told why. Finally, it was 19 pilots. The ranking pilot was the first lieutenant. They were the captain who was assigned in charge of us. He was not part of our squadron. The 19 pilots were transferred to another base at Atcham, England, which, oh, Watersham was close to Ipswich, England. We were transferred to Watersham, to uh, Atcham, which was 60 miles south of Liverpool. We all loaded up in jeeps, weapon carriers, all our baggage. I was in the jeep. I was driving with my flight command, my element commander, who was Billy Pitts, who we graduated from flying school together. I was the best man at his wedding. He was the best man at mine. We were driving along in this line in convoy, and we passed a base up in our middle of our trip, and there was a bunch of pilots out hitchhiking town at a, at a military or airport, air force base. We stopped, and of course pilots just got jumped into whatever vehicle was near, and the man that got in with us was Elton Ruby. I went to school with Elton. My wife is his cousin, my present wife, you might say, is his cousin. And if he had gotten in one jeep ahead of us or one behind us, we would have never seen him. So we had quite a conversation. At Watersham, at uh, Atcham, rather, we were issued airplanes. I'm still signed out with four P-39s, and I don't have them. But we serviced our own airplanes, we maintained our own airplanes, and we did the test hops that we needed to do. We had belly tanks. We had to test them for how long we could stay up how many hours on a belly tank of 120 gallons. Now, you learn a whole lot about mechanics, which I had no trouble with because I had background mechanics. A lot of them did not have, and we had to do a little bit of work on our airplanes, which, of course, we all pitched in and did. We had to time our airplanes to see how far we could go on 120 gallons of gasoline at a certain speed, at a certain manifold pressure, which was set for us. And we all tested our airplanes and found out that we could come out well enough. We had no idea what we were testing for yet. The 120-gallon belly tank, only two, three inches off the ground when the wheels were down, it was a flat type of tank. And it had a baffle long ways, but no baffle crossways. Now, when you turn your airplane, you had to throw it up in a bank and then center the gasoline slush around on the belly tank. It made it a little more interesting to fly. From there, we finally told where we were going, and we were going to North Africa, and we were going to fly from England to North Africa. So the whole squadron of us, this was all planned, took off one morning. It was in about the 10th of January, 1943. We flew from there to Land's End, which is a point which is the south end of England. We flew very low level, so they couldn't pick us up on radar. We did pick up radio, air, or radio evidently from German sources, routing us different than what we were instructed to take. We disregarded it, but we did hear the transmission. There were about three of us that couldn't talk because we had laryngitis so bad from the tag gone bad English weather. We were glad to get away from England any way we could. We got to land's end, it was miserable. This sits right out on the ocean, there's a cliff, and there's the airport sitting right on top of the cliff. The wind went across. We had no transportation. We were put in small buildings away from the center of the area where we had to go for lunch, and meals, and where we spent our days. We spent about three or four days there. Everything damp, you had very little heat. England was very tightly rationed. They had to be. Well, came the day when we were told to take off. It was rain, it was blowing across the field, and not an airplane missed takeoff. We all went. There were 19 of us. We were to follow a B-25. There were four airplanes that had gun floated. Those four airplanes were for support in case we got jumped by the Germans coming out of France. 
Billy Pitts and I were on the left side, which would be towards France, and we were the two on that side that had our guns loaded. Luckily, we didn't see anything on the way where we had to drop our belly tanks and go. The flight before us, it took off about the 1st of January. It was another uh, group of our squad, of our group. It was another squadron of our group. One of their pilots, they, a German reconnaissance airplane, a twin engine, probably a Messerschmitt, came up close to them and looked at what they were doing. Well, this pilot dropped his belly tank as he had been instructed to do. He turned towards the airplane. The airplane ran away from him. He turned towards, he wasn't going back to England. So on his wing tank, which was 120 gallons, he almost, by flying direct, he almost made Gibraltar. He was within sight of the field. He was coming in for a landing, and the engine quit as he had to make a slight turn right at the end of the field. He washed out his landing gear, but he did make Gibraltar. He made the field. He made, he the, made the field, but he washed out his land gear doing it. The fighter groups that had, uh, one fighter group that I knew real well, 31st Fighter, they'd been on the field with us at New Orleans, and then they were later on the field with us in North Africa. They had Spitfires. They were sent to, at the same time period, they were sent to Gibraltar, and they were in on the invasion of North Africa. There's a little more fighting there than most of your history books mention. Some of our pilots, and our ground officers, all of our ground officers, had come into Casablanca on landing ships, landing boats. One of our ground officers, they sunk the landing boat, and he was the only one that got out of it and made sure. He caught a cold, and three days later he turned into the hospital. Now I'm getting my story from this man. I know him real well. He turned into the hospital, and he... With his cold, and about a day later, General Patton came in and interviewed a bunch of the men and was very impressed with them, and he went to the door of the hospital and waved his arm and said, Give every man in this hospital a Purple Heart. Our man got it with a cold. A couple of fellers got in there with a venereal disease, and they got the Purple Heart too. But the Spitfires took off from Gibraltar on that invasion, and their instructions were to land to capture and land at a base just south of Oran, which they did. d teams came up at them, but there was not much going on. They both landed on the same field. Of course, we came in much later than that, and we landed at Port Laodi and then flew the next day from there to, incidentally, it was almost an eight-hour flight, single-engine airplane where you don't move. You sit there in the seat, and none of us could sit down for quite a while after we got to North Africa, but it was sure did look pretty sunshine. The next day we flew to Ujda, Morocco, and that's where we were stationed, the whole squadron was stationed there. About a week later, uh, most of our pilots and the skeleton ground force was sent to Euclid Bain. It was up behind Cat on our side of Catherine Pass, and they were to start in to work there. They had, we were five short of airplanes because some of our men had come in on boats. The youngest ranking in the squadron, which I was one of, were left at the base at Ujda. We had an executive officer who was a gung-ho National Guard officer from a long time back who took over command of the squadron, and he had the enlisted men towing the line and putting white stones outlining their pup tents and such things as that, and of course these mechanics and armament men started complaining to us, but we were always a bit good friends with them. We had to keep up with what they were doing. They told us what was going on. We talked about it, the five of us, and in Air Force orders, the ranking pilot takes command of the squadron. So we talked it over, and we found out which pilot of the five of us, we were all at the same rank almost exactly, but which man had the lowest serial number. We talked to the group commander who was on the base, and he backed us up totally. He says, that's right, the ranking pilot. Next morning, here was a second lieutenant pilot sitting in the CO's chair. This uh, first lieutenant executive officer came in and says, what are you doing there? He says, I'm taking over the squadron. Things are going to be different. It was. <laughs> it changed things considerably. But not long after that, the rest of us were sent to use the veins, and that's when we went into our combat work. We developed our techniques 
<coughs> because a lot of it was not taught in flying school. There was no way that they could foresee what the situation was, what we were doing. We were flying P-39s, which were fighter airplanes. They were pretty well armored, the, met the models that we had. We flew low-level attack missions. Our primary mission was reconnaissance. By that time, we were tactical reconnaissance instead of observation. We had officers that we thought a lot of in command. These men we would have followed any place, I think, because they were one that we, some that were well respected. We took our turns, you might say, at flying these reconnaissance missions, and they were not too often because we had 24 pilots. <coughs> we didn't fly too many missions, usually two a day. Some of them were two, pilots, two airplanes, some of them were four, depending on the situation. We flew low level, not over 10 or 15 feet high. This is a semi desert area. And the Germans at that level, they had a lot of trouble trying to fire on us because they couldn't get the, their guns fast enough evidence to realize the speed. When we went across the German groups, we went across <coughs> at 320 miles an hour, drawing 75 inches of mercury on the manifold pressure, which is all those engines would stand. But they did stand it with no trouble. And we lost over a period of several months until after the campaign was over. We lost just about half of our original group of pilots. We had some replacements, but actually our replacements came after that was over. One valley where we flew through every morning for, for a week or so, we lost a pilot every morning on that. We came in from up sun, we flew low level, four airplanes, they always sent four. I was on that one morning, and I lost a pilot next to me. The other day I was on it, <coughs> and uh, my good friend, Billy Pitts, who was my wing composer, my leader, got hit right in the rudder. Of course, he squalled, he got hit. We looked at him, that's all we could do right then, because you just can't do much at 10 foot off the ground. When we passed the Germans, we pulled up, two of us closed in on them, and we could see that the rudder surface, control surface, was gone. It had the outline, all the metal. But on a P-39, the end, one thing is the engine is behind you on a P-39. If the engine gets fired, you don't see it immediately. Behind you, your stabilizing pin and your, your solid surfaces are metal, but the movable surfaces, the rudder and the elevators, are covered with fabric. If your engine catches fire, they're gone immediately. That's what happened to the man next to me when I lost them. Well, Billy Pitts had lost the covering off his rudder and nothing else. So he flew home with it all right. Somewhere there's a picture of it with his head stuck through it. He was lucky all the way around. <coughs> After the Afghan ca <coughs> campaign was over, they pulled us off. I only flew 15 combat missions. After the campaign was over, they pulled us off and sent us to a small, what had been a French Foreign Legion base near Orleansville. And we stayed in what had been French Foreign Legion quarters. And we had a field, and the field was just smoothed out dirt, and that's it, because again, this is semi desert. Well, we flew in the mornings on training flights, and in the afternoons we did nothing because an airplane would burn you if you touched it. It got up to 120 degrees at times. We did have a swimming pool that was stagnant water, but sometimes it felt good to paddle your, water, your feet in it anyway. It was just strictly in case of fire. At that time, some of our enlisted men found several gliders, training gliders that the French had had. They were in revetments and torn apart, and that was it. They put one together, and it was one of them that was a crew chief on the airplane I used to flew. And he told me, he said, we can't rig it. Well, I had done some of that in Tennessee and seen Mr. Jones do it, so rigged it, got it trued up, and then I test topped it. So I knew nothing to fly in the glider. We pulled them off the Jeep. We found a thousand foot of cable where we could get a hook behind the Jeep that the French had used. The well, first things were we would take off. And we found out that the Jeep would work better in four in low range, four-wheel drive, in second gear, and don't shift gear because you disturb your flight pattern. So first started, we would fly along, take off, and ease it up through them. Then we found out that we couldn't stall the Jeep. We just haul back up, go up, go up like a glider, go up like a kite. They worked much better. Then we could stay up there. We could stay as long as maybe 15 minutes. It depends on the air currents, and there was not much lift off of them in that country because it was fairly flat. 
but you could talk back and forth to the men on the ground and tell them where you were going to land. In landing it, again, think of an airplane, you get down close to ground and you're almost sitting on the bottom of it. It's a skid. Well, you sit there and you pull back on the stick and you ease back on it, ease back till it stalls out, and by that time you're a half mile down the strip. We found out that it was, and the man could run along beside you and talk to you. So we found out pretty quick that you bring it down close to the ground and you're very close to stalling speed. You just push the stick forward and push it in the ground. It rocks a time or two and it's there. There's no trouble at all. So we did learn to fly gliders. I was sent home after that, and five of us were sent home. You said you'd flown only 15 combat missions? That's right. But you said you were flying two a day? Or the group, the squadron. Oh. There was only one squadron. We were the only squadron in the U.S. Air Force that was flying that type of operation. That's the reason we had to develop flights. That's one reason we lost so many pilots, because we didn't, at first now, they didn't know what we were doing. We never flew what you would consider straight and level and smooth flight over the German lines. We stirred that stick around like you're stirring soup. We bounced up and down and sideways, flew sideways even, any way we could to throw their fire off, and we did pretty well with it. We lost very few airplanes for that type of flying. They couldn't reach us with the big guns. But those machine guns, you could see them, the bullets looked like they were coming exactly at you, and then they'd go in behind you like the wind had blown, because the Germans had a trouble keeping up with what our speed was. We had trouble with them the same way. You could see, see the bullets? Oh, tracers, yes. Oh, oh they were tracers. Oh, those tracers, machine guns, you could see them. They'd be shooting down at us from the hillsides because it was in a valley. After that from campaign, like I said, we went to Orlandville, and then I got sent home as an instructor. And at Key Field, well, on my, I had about 10 days leave at home, which I enjoyed, to go back to where I was going to Meridian, Mississippi. I had to go through Nashville, so I called the woman, that girl that lived up on the corner from me. She was working in Nashville. And told her I'd like to have a date with her that night. She said, fine, who is this? That night, we hit it off nicely. I stayed three nights. I was AWOL, but when you've been in combat, you have a different attitude. You figure nothing can happen to me. And I think all of us had that. And it didn't. The CO, the wing commander, that Meridian, was a lieutenant colonel, his name was Johnny Dice, and he had been my squadron commander in North Africa. I knew him very well. He wasn't going to let anything happen to me, and I knew it. Didn't know he was down there then. Well, three months later, I enjoyed that down there. We had a uh, good group. We had a, uh, the students were not young men. There were people who had been in squadrons for many years, or for many years comparative back in that period of time, a year was a long time it seemed like, but they were not young pilots, they were ones who had been flying quite a bit, they were in there for training on observing as we had learned it. It was quite a school. Six months later, four of us were sent back to England on messed up orders, which we didn't know about on a prior, all at once, four of us were gathered up, I'd been married three months, four of us went back to England, and this is this woman from Meridian, huh? Yeah, from Meridian. And we loaded on a train. Well, what was her What was her name then? Yeah. Well, you mean Betty Houseover? Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. yeah. Goodness. Well, it took us a month or two to get. Oh, another part of that was we every six weeks we'd have a different class. So every six weeks with our class we would go to Mo to. Uh, Block to Mississippi, fly out of that field, and we would pull tow targets. The students would fire on us. We would fly over Petit Bois Island. Well, that was interesting because you get in behind that armor plate and hope those tracers aren't coming at your back, although we had no trouble. Well, in the meantime, I was writing to her, calling her, and everything else, and we decided to get together. So I had a leave coming. As soon as we went off one of these practice gunnery trips, I had a P 40 assigned to me for the trip. I was going to take a cross country to Nashville, had my maps laid out. We flew from there. We got to, to back to our home field, and all personal cross countries had been canceled, so I didn't ever did fly up there. Put a talker into coming down there. She and her mother came down on a train a certain day. The prep, the chaplain and I had to set up everything of the wedding ceremony because, of course, none of her family was there. She and her mother came down, and my mother and sister, I believe it was the other 
and the wedding was a military wedding, of course, everybody was there in uniform. The Johnny Dice and several of the ranking officers had a reception for us at Johnny Dice's house, and they didn't miss a thing. They had ham, they had everything you could think of. It was quite a party. And we had an apartment, or a house rented first, so we had a nice life down there with a group that we knew, a bunch of friends, it was, we enjoyed it. All at once I was sent back to, this was in February of 44. Of course I wasn't anxious to go. Well I got to England and found out we were on a sign. We had no idea what they wanted with us and they didn't know. But you didn't expect to be back, be sent back overseas? No, no, I, you, I didn't expect to. They told us we went back to, when we went from Radio, that, uh, that we wouldn't go back. They, we were training men to go, but we would not go. We went. So, we were signed to wherever they could put us. One man named May wanted to go in a fighter outfit. He went in the 354th fighter and he lasted two weeks. Another one was Leon Friedman from New York, and his specialty was high altitude reconnaissance. That's what he'd been flying in a P-38. So he went to a P-38 group of high altitude photo reconnaissance. Billy Pitts and I, we did service work. We flew different groups. We did whatever just needed to be a spare pilot. I flew the chaplain up to Burton on the Trent to get some chaplain supplies. I flew the one of the sergeants who was in charge of the operations. I flew him to another base to gather a bunch of papers, things like that. We checked out airplanes. I took General Cusada's airplane to uh, to uh, London for him several times uh, through UC-78 on different utility missions and that was all, just something to do. Flew a Tiger Moth, checking it out, different things. Then, along came the invasion, it was getting close. Billy Pitts was sent to a uh, ground infantry outfit as an air officer. Now, he was not down in the lower ranks, he was up in more of the division type. He wasn't down in the actual close to the front of that. I was sent to the Navy for a month at Plymouth, England. I was in a tunnel, 72 foot deep, covered with concrete and dirt, air conditioned with its own supply unit if the electricity should go off, and it was a command center in case the invasion totally backfired. All the ranking officers would come back to this base and take over from us, and we were just there to keep the lines of communication active. So I was sitting there asleep when the invasion happened. They came in and handed me a note on it. A little while after that, I was sent into France, and then I was sent up to an infantry outfit to a division headquarters as an air officer, and then later I was sent to the Combat Command B of the 3rd Armored Division, and I had five men, a half-track, a jeep with a 12 volt radio and full radio equipment. I had another jeep that was a service jeep. We had a trailer behind the half track, we had two trailers behind the jeeps. It was a pretty good unit. These boys were excellent at gathering supplies and they told me, said, Lieutenant, you don't want to find out where we got them. I said, that's fine. They furnished us with food, they did the cooking, they did a beautiful job of it. I had a couple of men that were good cooks. One night they were going to play poker when they were sitting there doing nothing. One of these boys popped up and says, I'm from Las Vegas. Said, you don't want to play blackjack. Let me show you what I can do. And I had no idea that they could do that much with cards. He was a professional dealer. He would not play cards with you. He wouldn't gamble with you. But he showed us what he could do. It was an education. We were sitting behind the St. Lowe Breakthrough, ready to go. And the St. Lowe Breakthrough was a thousand airplane raid and the bomb line was the St. Lo Pierre's Road, which was a fairly straight road, just ahead of where we were. After this raid, we were supposed to go immediately through that section where the Germans would be pretty well shook up, and they were. Well, just about the time all this comes up, my half-track driver drives, I was on the radio, my half-track driver went down through a field to turn to come headed back out, and it settled down clear to the top of the treads. It broke through the turf. Well, there we sat. We had to have it or we walked off and leave it. That was our instructions. So he had a winch on the front of it. We pulled the trailer out. We had plenty of man supply. 
We pulled the trailer out behind the Jeep, got it up on solid ground. We got a, a six-wheel armored car to get up ahead of us where it was solid. We hooked a line up to them and winked it out. Thank goodness we had our half-track, because that's what we practically lived out of. I slept in the front of the half-track. It was a pretty good place, and then, too, I was close to the radio. I was strictly on the radio. It was an interesting job in that I was kept track. They posted me ahead of everything that was coming up, everything that was done. That was my job, was to keep air support, dive bombers they had them working with me. I had a call sign of Bronco, and I stayed on the radio all day just for that purpose. And quite often, that's what the, it was as an active time. One morning, well, one day we were pulled in on a French town that was paralleling a railroad. The houses were all on one side of the railroad. The road was between the railroad and the houses, and we were lined up behind these houses. We actually went through an archway to get back in where we were. I was sitting right straight behind that house where my radio was clear. I saw a couple of P-47s coast overhead. And I heard one pilot say to another, look at that Mark V tank down there. Let's go down and drop some bomb. I got on the radio immediately. So the airplane just made the call. Who are you and where are you? They told me. I said, don't touch that airplane. It's just ahead of the building. I'm standing up on a half track waving at you. Well, they could see me. We had been through that Mark V tank, and it looked like it had run out of gasoline. Nothing was left and uh, destroyed. It was all totally. It looked like it was just fired it up and driven it off. They must have run out of gas. Oil. I didn't want to bomb it that close to me. Another time, a uh, flight called me, and we have a column of horse-drawn artillery spotted. I checked it on the map, and I told, I've been told anything that's horse-drawn is theirs. We don't have any horse-drawn equipment. The pilot laughed and says, all we have is rockets and machine guns. I can imagine, and this was on a narrow hedgerow road, I can imagine what a time they had with horse-drawn artillery on a narrow road with rockets and machine guns. And these things had eight machine guns. They sound like thunder when they went off. I don't know the end of that story because I didn't hear any more. Another morning, the pilot called me. We have a line of German Mark IV tanks. Instantly, the Mark V was what I got hit by. It weighed 45 tons. The Mark IV weighed 60 tons. It was their heavy Tiger tank. And they had seen about, I believe it was four or five of them, in a line on a road moving. I told them, I said, that's, that's in our lines. If they're behind our lines, we're in trouble. Make sure what you're seeing. One of them says, hold on. He went down and made a pass at them. And all at once, the men popped out every place, put flags on them, everything they had. Somebody, some of these tankers had captured four tanks, I think it was, and were bringing them home with them so they could play with them. And they were up waving at these boys. It was an interesting job. One morning in August, the mid pits again was only three miles from me. We'd been talking on the radio and been visiting. Uh, we were the squadron, or the tank, officer in charge of the air services. He was a captain and he suggested that we, with permission, that we get up on a certain point up near our tank column and work from the jeep in the radio, a radio jeep, to do what we had to do because we had good contact that way. Well, we got down there and we pulled up on a little side road and we went down by 100 yards and there were two men in our jeep. He knew them. We pulled over and talked to them. And they were hunting fire, the source of fire, coming in on the tank column, and they couldn't locate it. So about the time he stepped out, he told me to move a jeep, and that's the last move he made. Shell went off between us. I got hit in the arm, I knew, I didn't know where else, and all I could see was a bunch of smoke. Ran off the left, I hit the dirt, and all I knew was my arm was broken. This tank, 40 five tons and I knew it and his tread looked six foot across and I knew he was come climbing up me he just missed me he got my leg both arms <clears throat> it's not pretty okay well yep to back up a little bit first crossing 
I made was on the Queen Mary. The second, well, coming back, we came back by Marrakesh, Dakar, into Brazil, up the coast, and into Miami. When I went back over, I went to New York, and we flew from New York to Newfoundland to Scotland. When I came back on that with a hospital plane, and it was from Scotland to the Azores, to Bermuda, to Long Island. So I made several different routes. To back up to where I was a minute ago, the Germans picked me up, two German men, a half th This was a, along one of the hedgerows? In the hedgerows, yes. It's where you can't see out. Hedgerows just like climbing a brick wall. That's the reason I couldn't get away from the tank. So I think he would have gotten me anyway. That was his plan, because I'd seen him do it. So they picked me up, carried me a while. I don't know how far. I was talking to them as near as I could. And then we joined by two more, and they sure looked bad. They had needed shaves, and it looked like they had, hadn't had a bath in weeks. It was just, they had been in a lot of rough duty, it seemed like. They were good to me. The four of them picked me up, and the two of them were carrying me by my shoulder in a jacket. And my head was scooted down the jacket, and I couldn't see out. I would stick my head out like a turtle to see where I was. It wouldn't make a difference. All I could see was trees. They did the best that they could for me. They loaded me up after they got wherever it was they were going. It looked like a dry stream bed. And they put me on a letter. They put me across the back of an American Jeep. And it, evidently they had captured it. They had a German uh, man that had been shot in the middle of his back and had his shirt off. He was just in the seat ahead of me, leaned forward. How far I went, I don't know. But I went to a German field hospital, evidently, because I woke up in kind of a tent deal. And this German doctor was talking to me. And he cut off my shoes. He dug a piece of shrapnel shell fragment out of my shoe, about the size of my thumbnail, put it in my shirt pocket. He cut my wedding ring off and put it in my shirt pocket. He cut my clothes off and dressed. Well, right then, he was just talking to me. He wanted to know where I was from. I told him my name, Cyril Miller. He says, where are you from? I said, I can't tell you that. He said, we got to have it to have it on the record. He spoke some English. So I told him Kentucky, and that seemed to satisfy him. That was close enough. I didn't know anything about sodium pentothal, but I found out then it put me to sleep immediately. When I woke up, I was burning up. I could see waterfalls. I was in a French barn in what would be the hall in the center of the barn in a back corner on a, on a bunch of hay. Nobody around. The door was open at the other end. I saw a Frenchman go by a holiday, and I knew enough French words to ask him for water. So he brought it to me in a bucket. He poured it over my head, down my throat. It was wonderful. I went back to sleep. I woke up in an ambulance. And I don't know where we were, but the ambulance was stopped, and we could hear airplanes, and I knew that we had orders to fire on any German vehicle, whether it was an ambulance, a truck, or no matter what it was, because they brought reinforcements up by ambulance. So they had pulled, they knew it, and they had pulled in under a trees until these airplanes passed over. Well, then I got, woke up in the hospital. I had no idea where I was. It was a German hospital. I was on the end bed, and there was a young German in the bed next to me who had an awfully bad arm. But when I needed something, well, I would tell him, and he would understand what I wanted, and he would get somebody in there. But the biggest trouble I had was getting drink water and they just don't drink water. But it was interesting in that it's like the movies. There were two men across from me that were evidently SS troops who were the fanatics, and it, they, the way they stared at me, if they could have gotten out of bed, I never would have. But the rest of them were nice to me. They took care of me and this and that, or whatever they could. But in the morning, every morning, the German doctors would come in at the far end of the ward. There was evidently a staircase there, bound to be. And as soon as they hit the door of the ward, every man in his bed, standing up or anything else, popped to, came up with a Heil Hitler. The doctor's Heil Hitler, and the way he'd go talking to the different people. Well, they stand in front of me, but they never did anything about it at that time. I was just there. I never saw it get dark. I never had an ache or a pain. When they got a candy ration, it was four little pieces of hard candy, and I got mine just like the rest of them. I couldn't eat them because I couldn't even take them, get them open them, but I got them. I was taken out of there and put in an ambulance with another American. 
and we traveled I don't know how far but we went into what I found out later was an old convent and it was in Orleans France now we were in a room that where you went in the front door through a hall you went directly to this room it was a good sized room there were 13 of us in there and they were British uh, Canadians and several Americans all of us were what you might say pretty well beat up or only two three of them could walk I don't know how many days we were there but just above my head where I never saw out the window there there was a courtyard and there were a bunch of prisoners there who were some Italian some were French Foreign Legion there were some Russian this is what a British ship's doctor he was Canadian actually he spoke French excellently because of the area he came from in Canada he had been in there three months. He had an awfully bad leg. He begged them to take it off, and they wouldn't do it. There were two British doctors who were prisoners and had been prisoners since Tobruk, which had been three years. And they, of course, were well treated. German treated all of us well, with the head. And the French doctor that was definitely in charge of the hospital, he and his wife would come in with a big smile and laugh, go through there and talk to every one of us and see how we'd get along there. He's the one actually that took care of us. Well, this big black from Sen Senegal would pick me up. I went to the operating room twice. He would come in there with a big smile, talking to me like I was a baby. He would put his hand under my shoulder and his other under my leg, pick me up like a baby. He would carry me to the operating room, which was down the hall. The French doctor only had hydrogen peroxide. It was actually the only medicine stuff that he had. He had very little bandage. Well, I had two tubes. I had a tube through my leg and a tube through my arm, which shell fragments had gone through. These were pieces of cane drilled out sent in the center and drilled out on the sides to make wicks. The way we use cotton bandage, they use these cane tubes. They use paper that was like uh, like uh, paper towels. It was rolled up in sheets, just like uh, just like bandages, rolled up, and that's the only bandage they had. This doctor had some of those cotton. He did what he could for us. I was in bed there, and of course, like I told you, I had no pain until I got back to Americans finally, because I guess it was just too much shock, too much pity. The Germans, well, for that, I was talking to a ship's doctor, and he had been talking to, he had a mirror, and he would talk to the man out in the courtyard with a mirror, because he couldn't get up to speak to him, and he knew him by name, he'd been in there for a while. There was one in there that uh, he was talking to one day, and he told me his story. He was a prince of his tribe, and he was from Senegal. I said, tell him I was in Senegal a year ago. I came through there going home. Well, a little later, the German guards were taken off. They knew that the Americans were getting awfully close to us, so that most of the guards were gone. There were no guards out in the hall. This man came in, and he would stand up. He was tall. He was absolutely black. Even his eyeballs looked dark. His teeth were shiny. He walked like a prince. He stood just as straight as a ramrod. He was a prince of his tribe, and he was homesick. Oh, he'd come in and talk to me, goodness. I couldn't understand what he said. But when, well, there was a Canadian, um, no, it was an Irish boy came in. Of course, all of us are young men. And he had a bullet hole right in the middle of his party. Uh, the Germans brought him in. One of our English doctors dressed his wound, which is, it wasn't bleeding. He just put bandages around it, about hit his eyes, and that's all he could do. They undressed him partly and put him to bed, the second bed over to me. There was a Canadian in the bed next to me. The Canadian was could get up. He was an arm case. And he talked to this young man and got his story, which we all heard. Nobody said a word in there. He had been on a special mission, five of them, behind the German lines in uniform, British uniform, to gather information on supply dumps, supply routes, things like that. They were on foot. They had many codes, papers, things like that, and money with them. So he told us what had happened, and then he told this Canadian, asked him, he says, who is here? He told him, he says, every one of you know him? He says, yes, I know every one of them here. He says, all right, and he told him where to get papers out of his tunic 
and out of his shirt that it had been sewed in. He says, get rid of them. I don't care where. Well, the Canadian, the uh, British doctor, one of them came in, and this boy handed it to him and said, get rid of them. So he took them upstairs, and we found out later, put them under the floor. After that, just before dark, uh, Gestapo came in. Now, the Gestapo looked like Gestapo. When they walk in, you know who they are. I don't know why, but we knew who they were when they walked in. This man was in civilian clothes. He had two dressed, well, army men with him. His English was excellent. His manner of asking questions was as smooth and polite as could be. And this Canadian was just like fencing with him. Every time he asked a question, this Canadian has an excellent answer. He did a beautiful job. He asked him about this man. He said, yeah, they brought him in. So this doctor dressed his head. And he says, well, has he said anything? He said, yeah, he's grunted several times. You couldn't see his eyes because the man is down over his eyes. He said, well, have you been through his papers? And the man said, yeah. He says, we went through his, two of us went through his tunic. He says, here's all we found that they paid out of books. He says, that's all he had on him. Well, Gestapo finally questioned for quite a while. And finally, he left. Everything was absolutely quiet in here. And that man said, thank you. Uh, about the time the Americans were coming in to take Orleans, we knew from the British or the French doctor and from a Red Cross girl who was French who came in every day or two where the Americans were because it was common knowledge. They got close, the Germans started taking guards off. As they got closer, they changed things until the night before the Americans were taken over. They took everybody they could take out as slave labor to go to Germany. The British doctors, two of them, they had exactly the same length of service. They had gone in the army together. They had been through every bit of service together, and they flipped to see which one would have to go. The came in and to the doctor, the French doctor, and the British doctor. And they went through the Germans, some officer, and he went through every man in that ward, and there wasn't a man there that could get out of bed. This doctor explained to him exactly how bad off this man was, and it's a funny thing, several of them had been walking that afternoon, but at that time, not a one of them was able to get out of bed. So the Germans crossed them off. There's none, none of the men out of our ward were taken. Out of the backside, I don't know. Well, Americans came in the next day, and that's the first American they ever saw. But they <coughs> didn't get us out until late that afternoon, and that uh, French doctor came in and poured everybody champagne. And the British doctor came back in, and the British doctor told us what had happened to him. After dark, they loaded them all on a train. Now, the French trains have a hall down one side, like the British train. They have a hall down one side and then compartments all on one side. And they all loaded up a bunch of the town people. They loaded up with him along with a lot of others, and they loaded them on the train, and about dark they moved out going to Germany. The train wasn't moving real fast. Somebody in French stuck his head in and says, Get out. He didn't question it. Every one of them in that compartment just got out. The train was run about 15 miles an hour. They all hit the ground, and the French gathered them up as a free French. They gathered them up and took them to a chateau. How far it was, I don't know. And they kept them there until the next day when they knew that the Americans had come in. Had come in. The French French took over several places first. They took over the hospital where we were before the, actually before the Americans came in. That's when the, the British doctor came in with them. And the next day, they brought all their people back into Orleans. They didn't get out. They... Got them, out, got them out before they got any of them to turn. The Americans picked us up late that afternoon. They took us to some Italian aid station. I don't know where. That's where somebody stole my bill for them. The next morning they took us to a hospital. But again, I don't know where. And it was a big hospital. It was well back behind the line someplace. They had the 13 of us lined up. And the two or three of them could walk. I was about the first one on the line in my litter, and I was laid there on the ground. I guess it's maybe 9 o'clock in the morning when they brought us in there. We were watching people go by, and they could speak English, and we kind of talking among ourselves, and nobody ever paid any attention to us much. And a British doctor 
I believe it was Lieutenant Colonel. He came up and looked at us, and you could tell that he wasn't happy that he was seeing us there. I don't know what his thoughts were. I spoke to him. He said, you speak good English. And I said, I'm an American. I had on a German shirt, and several others did too. So I told him our story and how long we had been there, and he says, you this was after lunch. Everybody else had had lunch. We were afraid to move. So in five minutes, we were all taken care of immediately. I spent the night there, a German, uh, American nurse, first lieutenant. She shaved me. It's the first time I shaved in 19 days. She gave me her insignia. The next day, I was taken out. <clears throat> I was taken out of there. I didn't know how bad it hurt, but I was one of the first ones taken out of there. And I went to uh, somewhere at an airport at the clearing place, I guess you'd say. It was a big tent. There were a lot of people down there in the litter, just down on the ground. Well, I was in with a bunch of them. And the man close to me was having a lot of trouble, so I spoke to one of the doctors as he walked around and said, this man's having an awful lot of trouble. Can you do something for him? He looked at me and said, you need a blood transfusion. I still had my German shirt on. I said, I don't need a blood transfusion. I just got back from the Germans. I'm happy to be here. He said, where were you? I told him. He put a bowl of gauze around the end of my litter, and I was the next one out. We flew to England. And that man landed that airplane like it was on eggs. He did a beautiful job after dark in the blackout. Well, in England, I don't know where I was, but I got transferred the next day to a hospital, and that's where I stayed for about two months until they could get me ready to come home. It's Malvern Wells. From there, I went to Scotland, which was a hospital right next to the air base. I stayed there a month, and then I had a plane back and of course, on home, I came to Nicholas General Hospital in Louisville. I spent almost four years in the hospital. I was at Nicholas General in Louisville, I was in Martinburg, West Virginia, Camp Atterbury, El Paso, Texas, and I got out at Battle Creek, Michigan. That was in 1948. We got the house built right after I got out. Mike was born just about the same time the house got ready. David was a little older. He was running around at that time. So we have lived here for that many years. We've had a wonderful time, and I've stayed very active. I have a shop up there where I have built the many things the kids know about and they grew up with. I don't think really I've got too old because I've stayed with the kids and I have enjoyed it myself. So what else you want to know? Well, it's pretty good. That you, brings it up to where you know about it. Yeah. Um, when the tank hit you, you had talked about the two Germans and the way they had acted. They took good care of me. But you said the younger one pointed the rifle at you? No, they didn't. They never did point the rifle at me. Not that I remember. I don't, well, no, I don't remember that. They just talked to me and then uh, I told them, Camerad, Camerad. Well, they just picked me up and drugged me, it seemed like. And then I was joined by two others back in the woods someplace and they took me on out of there. The only thing I knew of was my arm was broken, and that was all I knew. But you were up next to the HRO and oh, the Oh, I was right back up against it. I was on my left side because I knew the right arm was broken. I pushed. That a tank couldn't have been not over 100 feet from me, but it took him a week to get there. Because I thought about a lot of things before he got there. So you knew he was coming, you could see oh, him coming. Oh, I knew he was. He tripped, and I knew he weighed 45 tons on me. And I feel like, looking back at it, I knew he would run over me. That was his plan. And I feel like that he couldn't get any closer to that hedgerow or he couldn't have been able to steer his tread out. That may have been it. Because he dang near missed me. He did a pretty good job of it. I left giving him credit. But he hit my head and knocked it out of the way. He ran over both arms, one knee, and it must have been in soft dirt. That's the only thing to say. I didn't examine it after that to see if it was soft. I would just got out of there or scooted out of there, you might say. But he didn't spin the treads on it. No, no, he didn't, which he could. Well, again, I feel like it must have. He was in flat out. He was moving fast. But it must have been because he was so close to that hedgerow. That hedgerow is just like a brick wall. And it's a pretty good job. A tank can't go through most of it. It takes a dozer tank. They had a bulldozer blade on the front of a lot of tanks that they did go through those hedgerows with. Those things have been growing probably a thousand years and made fences out of them. But the base of them would be up as 
as your waist, and it'd be just like trying to crawl a big wall. But no, the Germans took good care of me. I'll have to give them a lot of respect. They did take good care of me. They didn't have much to work with. The worst time I had was in England when uh, I was packed up ready to come home. I was in a shipping cast, which was a heavy one. I wasn't getting around. I could do a little bit of walking, but very little. And I couldn't get my temperature down. So they opened up my cast, and the doctor operated on it every other day, maybe for over a week, yeah. with no anesthetic at all, until he was through. As soon as he got through, she'd give me a shot. And it took eight minutes for it to take effect, because I'd count. Why no anesthetic? Uh, I didn't know why, but one day he got down there. He was working my right arm, which pretty bad messed up. And one day he grabbed the nerve, which was down under the bone, and I raised straight up. And he said, that's why you couldn't have an anesthetic. Mm -hmm. He put me in a private room. That was not a good time either. But they put me in a private room. I counted the bricks on the wall, the nails in the ceiling. I couldn't read. I had to have, well, a Red Cross representative would come in there and write home for me. That's the only first time she heard from me. And, uh, well, it was just the room where it was, I couldn't read, I couldn't do anything else. And at that time, I didn't know too many of them in the war to visit with. Well, several of them stopped by and visited with me. So I was on medication most of the time. I, <clears throat> I got to worried about it. I won't be able to get off this stuff. So I asked the doctor about it. And the doctor was marked a country type boy. And he said, you never worry about it as long as you're under our care. I've been afraid of it ever since. How do I know I have pain? How do I know that I have pain, or how do I know that maybe I think I have wanting something else? Yeah. I don't know. So I've always been afraid of it. I'll take a whole lot before I'll take it back. I didn't tell you why I drink water out of my hand. You've heard that before. When I was in that French farm, or farm I was drinking of water. And I was dreaming of a French village, which I had seen many times. And up against the wall of one of the buildings was a brass pipe sticking up, which was a well. It had an arm coming down, maybe three feet, with an arch. Brass arch looked like maybe a part of a circle with a brass ball on each end of it. Now to pump water, they would grab that and they would swing it back and forth and the water would come out the spout. I had never had my hand on one of them. And I was dreaming about pumping one of those with my head under there. I still remember. The worst time I had was in the Here in the States, when you have pain and that, everything has been there a long time, they take care of it. And in England, they didn't do well. Penicillin was a rusty. I was on penicillin a while. It was brown, and it was very painful. It was before they refined it down to where <coughs> the way it is now. You take a shot of it and pay no attention to it. But back then, it was like setting it on fire. It was the first use of it. Sulfonilamide is another thing that I think we learned on. Oh, it would sure give you headaches. Mm -hmm. And for an operation, I had better than 15 operations. I could count 15 general anesthetic operations. And they put us on penicillin if it was a serious operation for a week before and a week after. This is every two hours, day and night. And you get to where you don't even wake up. Now it does cause commotion. One night in the board, this was in Louisville, when somebody, I don't know who and nobody ever owned up, changed a bed tag of one man who was on this preparation period. The nurse was in there and she looked at bed tags and of course the rest of the nurses knew who he was. There was a new nurse that day. Now who maintained the bed tags, I don't know, but somebody did it as a joke and she was convinced that this was the man and he was going to get that shot whether or no. And he was just as convinced he wasn't because it wasn't him, it was the guy in the next bed. Wouldn't she look at his dog tag? No. I don't think we even had them on. So it ended up to be quite a disagreement until we had to get another head nurse in there. To There was always something going on in the world. I'll tell you, you could have written a book about those, what went on. Um, in 
England. We had a head nurse that came in and took charge of that area. Like I told you, I never did see the outside of that place. I don't know what it looked like. This head nurse would come in every night just about 9.15 or 9.30 when we had had our bedtime uh, pills or whatever we had and everything was quieted down for the night and she would come in there and just take her flashlight, shine around to see if everything was alright. Well, of course, we heard every sound that went on at that time. So one night, I don't know, of course, who did this. I didn't see a thing. Nobody did. Somebody got all the ducks or urinals which were metal, and bedpans, which were metal, and as they said, they laid a minefield at the entrance of the ward, right after everybody went to bed. Of course, nobody knows who did it. Well, that nurse came in there that night. She stomped around in there. She shined her light on it. She laughed and went out, and she never came back at that time. She learned. It just reminded her of it. But... Oh, Lord, if I get one on there. We had a man across the ward from us named him. And he was, uh, I believe he was in Carolina, he was a country talking about the feller. And he was in a Jeep accident. And he broke his hip to where he was in bed, but not in a cast. He just couldn't get out of bed. Well, he got his days and nights crossed up. He'd nap during the day, and then all night he'd be there, boy, boy, nurse, and something like that. Of course, woke everybody up. That went on for several days until finally the man next to him was hanging up traction. He was a leg injury. So just about the time this man closed his eyes, this man in the next bed, his name was Brady, Captain Brady, holler, boy, boy, bring me a pan. He'd bring him a bed pan and he'd bang it around a time or two. You don't need it right now. You wait now. I'll call you when I need you. Okay. So he'd lay it down beside him. A few minutes later, this man shut his eyes and started to go to sleep. And the bedpan would fall off right on between the beds. Of course, he'd pop wide awake, and this Captain Brady would have to holler for the ward boy again. That went on for a day, and that man slept at night. So the Army usually has a way of taking care of them. And I often wonder what happened to Captain Brady and the others that were right across the ward from me that I talked to so much. I never saw but one of them ever stand up. There was one of them I met two years later. I looked at him and he looked at me and he had seen me stand up, but I hadn't seen him stand up. And I said, you so-and-so, I forgot what his name was now. He says, yeah. And then he called me by name, but that's the only one of that group I ever saw. I don't know what happened in here. In the hospital, we met many, many people. And now I wish that I'd known enough to copy off a lot of them names. There are very few of them I've kept up with. And it'd be interesting to see how many of them came out. One bad time I had in an American hospital was in uh, Martinburg, West Virginia. And I was in the orthopedic ward, which is at one end of the hospital. Well, they operate on the nerve on the left hand to tie the nerve back together. And I couldn't use either hand. They had to feed me, take me to the bathroom, dress me, undress me, the whole lot, which kind of gets to your pride. It came up a Sunday morning. And I had to go to the bathroom and there was nobody on the ward. There was no nurse. There was no ambulatory patient. There was no ward boy. I couldn't find anybody. There were two or three bed patients and that was it. It was a different type of ward than I had been on. This was a neurological ward. So I walked the length of the hospital and caught one of the men down there where I had been on that other ward to take me to the bathroom. Now that gets to your pride. I called Mama. She came up there and spent, oh, a couple of days. She, when we, <coughs> we went in town to the hotel, oh, I forgot the name of it, been too long. I had a car up there, but we went town to the hotel. And she dressed me, she fed me, everything for two days. But I was all right then. She's had a lot to put up with. It's interesting looking back at it. Of course, the trip you and I took to Dayton, very interesting, when that I saw airplanes I had never seen for years. It was just like old home week looking at them. One was the L1, now the L1 was the one I took my daddy <coughs> riding in. And I don't remember how much time I built up on it, it seemed like quite a bit, but it was an airplane that if you looped it, it had automatic slots, and of course it had flaps, flap you control, the slots would pop out at a certain angle of attack. As you did a loop in it, none of it was real fast, all of it was slow. As you popped over the top, 
the slots would pop out. And then as you came down the back side and built up speed, they'd pop back in. That airplane would fly at 25 miles an hour. And uh, one time in Texas, we were chasing uh, deer around a little hill down there with it. <laughs> the deer were about to outrun us. But it was an interesting airplane. Of course, that's one of them I saw up there. And, uh, of course, several of the others. Another one up there was an old 52. I didn't know there was any of them left because it looked like a barrel with a stave across the it. Owl. The owl. that's right. We saw one hanging up up there. I had a little trouble with that airplane. It was a high wing and it had gas tanks in the wing. We were taught in flying school to, in one tank, you had a standpipe, which was a reserve tank. In other words, when you fed off of that tank, you only fed about halfway and then it would get to the top of that pipe and that's all you could get. You switched to the other tank. That was routine. When that tank got dry, you'd go back to the reserve tank and you better hunt for a field because you didn't have too much left. Well, that's where I was flying old 52 and all at once one day with a little bit of a crosswind. I landed and my right wing went down. Well, I kicked rudder into it and brakes just like we were taught to do it. popped back up, but it drugged the ground. The next day, I believe it was, we had the same wind conditions and the same thing happened to me. It put me off the runway. Of course, my instructor, uh, well, we had a flight leader who was actually an instructor to us. We were graduate pilots, but he monitored us pretty closely. He'd seen it both times. So he got me in the office, and we had a talk. And he said, what are you doing wrong? I, said, I don't know. I was flying just like I talked to him. Well, we were like cookie-cutter pilots. We were all trained the same way. He said, I ground you, but it wouldn't do any good. He said, you might as well keep flying and find out what happened. We sat there and talked a few minutes, and he finally asked me, he says, what tank are you feeding gasoline out of? I told him. He says, that's it. He says, the flight you've been taking, you are emptying one tank and then leaving enough in the other tank to pull that side down when you hit that critical speed of stalling. He said, level your tanks. I did after that and never had another problem with it. That was just the habit of that airplane. Another thing about that airplane was it had an Armstrong hydraulic system. It had a long lever on the left side. After you got off the ground, you put your wheels in the up position and you crank like crazy, about eight strokes to get the wheels up. We were under instructions and total do not disregard things that you do not start your landing gear up till you're 2,000 or 200 feet at least because you'd have a tendency to pump the control stick back and forward. But that was the habit of the airplane. Now, bringing the landing gear down, they were drop, putting their drop down by themselves, but they were interesting airplanes in that they were built for observation, and actually they were only for training because they would have never made it in a combat zone. The observer behind us, the pilot sat in a seat, looked like an office chair, and the observer sat behind you on a seat that would roll back and forward several feet. He had a long canopy. He could roll it to the back, take pictures, he could roll it to far, forward, work radio, and it changed the trim on the airplane. Nothing excessive, but it did change the trim. I had an observer up with me one day. Now, these observers were graduate men, you might say. They were qualified officers just there for additional training. I had one on the back with a K3B camera, which is a handheld, which is a heavy camera. It's got a handle on each side of it. He was taking a black picture, shooting out the side. We were, I guess, eight or 10,000 feet high. I hit a downdraft, and it went strong enough that it put him out of the, co out of the back of the cockpit. There's nothing I could do. All I could do was hold the airplane. And I just held it steady. His feet were off the floor. He stayed real still, and he dropped back in. Luckily, where the airplane was under him. I had that happen once to me in the Waco when Guy Jones and I were flying here at Tennessee. We got over the mountains. We never flew over a couple of thousand feet because what the use in that airplane. He had a downdraft with it, and there wasn't, I didn't have a safety belt in the front seat. So I went up. I hit the center section of the airplane with my head, and I grabbed a hold of the strut. He was in between struts. And I held on to that strut till the airplane hit the bottom of that pocket. There was nothing he could do. He just had to sit there until it hit the bottom. So after that, we kind of put our safety belts back in and used them. Normally on those trips, I had a, uh, I had a big toolbox beside me. Now that toolbox and me both got under that safety belt after that. But that, air, that airplane, the one we rebuilt and we hadn't, didn't have it finished. Yeah, it was an interesting time, goodness. Wars, thank goodness they don't happen too often.
Where did you meet little guy? We grew up together. He was raised here. His dad, oh, that's quite a story. His dad and mother lived down on uh, Longster Road. They have a stone house, which is still there, which was built before 1892. It had loopholes shooting in it. It's a beautiful place. And a uh, little guy was the only child. His dad was a very, what you'd say, adventurous type, very active. And he and his brother-in-law, this was during Prohibition, opened up a steel in a silo. The silo is still there. They had a windsock. He bought him an airplane, an old Rocco, a Rocco 10. This is something like 1928. He went to Troy, Ohio, where they built Rocco's, and learned to fly, and also learned to maintain his airplane. He was an excellent mechanic. And he learned how to maintain his airplane, do any repair that it needed. Well, he flew his whiskey in the airplane. They made good whiskey. They were proud of it. Uh, his brother-in-law was Wick Rogers. Scott Rogers still lives in this area. They had a big production group there, and I bet you there are places on that farm now where they hid their whiskey that nobody has ever found, that I have been told about, because Mr. Jones used to tell us about it when we were down here in Tennessee with him. The little guy and I went to, well, he got caught fine through somebody that worked his way in with him. And he spent three months in penitentiary. It ended up, his wife left him, he lost the farm, he ended up with nothing but an airplane. He said he was hopping past him in the farm farming in Virginia until he learned to eat raw peanuts and never did like peanuts after that. But uh, he ended up in Clinton, Tennessee as a mechanic in a hosiery mill. Now again, he was an excellent mechanic and he had no trouble at all with the job he had down there learning those knitting machines, which are pretty complicated. He stayed down there for years till he retired. But he hopped passengers every weekend and rebuilt airplanes. He was at, uh, this is 1940, the little guy and I went to uh, Somerset. His dad was flying out of Somerset, so I took him down there, of course. He was going to Tennessee with his dad. His mother lived up there in the room house, and she worked at the State Highway, which had an office here then. We went to Somerset, spent the airplane. Of course, his dad hopped a bunch of passengers, and the little guy had been taking time with his dad learning. So, outcome was, of course, his dad and my dad, friends, this and that, because all in a small town. So Mr. Jones invited me to come down and spend the summer. But when I went back home, I told him my dad, and that was fine, and he had a friend that was coming down through Clinton about the next day, so I loaded up my clothes and away I went. Well, I spent the summer with him, just moved in and lived with him. I had a ball, wonderful time. It was very educational, if nothing else. The little guy and I worked on airplanes during the day when his dad was working. When his dad got off work, he went to work early and got off at 3.30. And when he came home that afternoon, he would see what we had done. And we, we worked under him. And then we did whatever we needed to with him there. We rebuilt one airplane almost totally. We re rebuilt some of the ribs, and it was a Waco 10. And we rebuilt the engine where we had to grind the valve, fit piston rings, the whole business. Yes, it was quite an education. And your work has to be exact. We recovered, with his help, we recovered the wings, four wing panels. We doped or sold them. See, everyone has to be stitched to the ribs. We did that. The little guy could tie the knot and I'd feed them back to him. And we doped those things and you just get drunk as a monkey doping those things in the basement. We did, did it with a brush. So we'd come out and sit outside with the dope dried and we got sobered up and we'd go in and put another coat. It took about 10 coats of dope. But when we got that airplane finished, it was covered with bed sheeting instead of airplane fabric. It couldn't be licensed, but at that time you could identify an airplane. It was not required to be licensed unless you were hauling passengers. Now the airplane that we flew passengers in was licensed and inspected. So the one that was not licensed, we were bringing it up to Monticello because he had sold it to a group of men up there. So they came up with two airplanes Well, after a couple of forced landings they made Monticello. This was routine back then. You always had a field picked out. Those old, they were double lock sixes. They were Curtis engines, uh, OXX-6. Now the OX-5 was the first World War airplane that was very famous and common. It's what they used in the Guineas. And it was 90 horsepower, but this one had dual magnetists and it was 100 horsepower, so it was a little bit better engine. And it was an education working on it. It's different than anything you see now. But uh, they came to Monticello, we got there, 
and the one that was giving trouble was the regular airplane that we flew all the time. Now, I didn't fly, I was a mechanic. And I followed them in the automobile, and when they had a forced landing, they would land next to the highway so I could see them. Now, that was routine, and they could do it. They were that good with these airplanes. It was routine with them. Well, they got up there all right. Well, we were hopping passengers at Somerset, and that airplane kept clogging up and overheating. So we sat down and got to talking about it, and I, my idea was the only thing could be is something stopping up the radiator. He said, that sounds like it. So we took the radiator off and got a double handful of stuff out in town where they cleaned it out, got through with that problem. It was, yes, it was interesting. The rest of the story on the airplane that we rebuilt and he sold up there was that the men, the next summer, they all flew it. About four of them went together and bought it. The next summer, they pulled it out of the hangar. They were getting ready to go for the season and the tail skid post had broken right at the back of the fuselage. So one of them set it up on a barrel he got his electric welder out there. He flipped his hood down and he welded the tail skid in the post in place. When he raised his hood back up and looked behind him, the airplane was burning up. And it burned right there. That was the end of that one. So another airplane we worked on that summer was a Traveler. A Traveler had 175 horses. These are all hand cranking airplanes. And there was like a cranking airplane that way. But this traveler that we serviced for the spring, is what it was, check it out. It was a smooth airplane. It had slick fabric on it, just clean as a pen. But we serviced the thing, checked it out, and this and that. And he got us, Mr. Jones, this was at Williamsburg, we put us in the front cockpit and we took off in that thing. I knew he was going to loop it. I got to looking out through there and I could see those little bitty ribs, thinking about it. He did the first loop. It went off mine, and he did about 10 more, and I was sitting there laughing. I had got over looking at that wing, trying to see if it was going to come off, because I knew it wasn't going to. We moved that airplane and took it to, it was later, we took it to uh, Island Airport at Knoxville. So Mr. Jones and I were riding, and Guy McClellan was flying it. Well, the front cockpit actually wasn't much room for two people, and it had dual controls in it, which made it a little bit tighter at that. As we got started in at Knoxville, Mr. Jones told me, he said, get out, I need room to handle the controls. So I got out, sat out on the wing, didn't think a thing about it. And I sat there and looked down until they landed the airplane. That's the only time I ever went out on the wing in the air, but I tell you, it was no problem. We were well familiar with those airplanes. I wasn't worried about a thing. I knew what he was going to do. So yes, it was an educational summer. You didn't have parachutes at all? Oh no, no, no civilian plane has parachutes. He had a parachute jumper with him at one time. He was an excellent pilot. He and Guy McClellan both. I never thought about it at the time because I thought everybody did that. Well, they'd fly off the hillsides. They'd take off down the hillside in Clinton from behind the house. Where he lived in Clinton was up on the hill. And I guess it's all development now, but there was a vacant lot, two, three vacant lots below him. And I mean below him. It was a hogback. And down the hill just dropped off. And behind his house it dropped off where it was close to being straight up down, down at the ravine. Now this would be about three lots, I guess, three or four building lots. And above him was one empty lot. So we'd work on airplanes, low wacos. He would pull it up into that, back, we'd back him out. He'd pull it up into that vacant lot above him. We'd get on the wingtip, because it didn't have brakes. And we'd spin him, and as soon as he got straight, we'd drop under the wing. He would take off down through the backyard. He'd already hit the tail up. And he had six foot from each wingtip, from the fence one side of the house to the other. He thought nothing, to had a rag on the fence from the wingtip side. So then when he went off that hill, he didn't have to go far, but he was flying. And landing, he'd come back up the hill, he'd feed it what throttle he needed to get up close to the house, and as soon as he cut throttle, it was on the ground. And it took a lot of throttle to get it back up to the house. I thought that was routine, I thought everybody did it. I didn't know you had to have a smooth field to land on, and the further I got into flying, the more I appreciated what they did with the tail skid. One was out of, the uh, field was out of uh, high, uh, Hall's Gap. If you take the old road up to Hall's Gap, and right at the top of the hill there used to be a lookout, and then just past that and around an S-curve was a store. Right at the edge of that store was a road that went out to a field It was a short distance there. And it sat at the slope, and he went up the slope to an extent, then off the brow of Hall's Gap. It dropped about 300, 200 feet, I guess. You had to be in the air, but then. 
we have passengers one fourth of July there and never thought a thing about it and come find out that uh, several years back a guy had gone, some man had gone off the side of an airplane and killed himself with it. So we didn't know about that, or we thought about that at the time, but they were sure of their airplane and everything worked fine. It was a very educational summer. Another time it was with uh, Nancy, the Dollar National Park across the road from it. It was a short field and they blew a tire. Well, on that car, we had extra wheels, we had extra cylinders, we had everything but an extra propeller. So a little guy and I got under the wing where the compression strut was, that's a strong point. And we came up with our shoulders, and big guy claimed to change the wheel with us holding it up. It wasn't too much, you had a lot of leverage on it. Another time, we were at Woodstock, which was just a little crossroad place between, well, it would be on the road between Crab Orchard and Eubank, back in that area. And short field, and taken off down the field, and then you headed right into a low hill. So you had to make a right turn, climbing, and then climb out because the ground went uphill. Well, we did that, well, all one morning, and then that afternoon, just as he made his turn, the little guy was flying the airplane, he had two young men in the front cockpit, and this was the Baco, engine whip. Well, he couldn't get over the fence into the barnyard, and he knew it, but he jumped it rather than hit the fence. And when he did, of course, it went up on his nose and stopped. And we're not talking about a great deal of speed. We may have been 25, 30 miles an hour. Well, he said he was bracing himself so he could undo his safety belt, and he could hear the two young men in the front seat. One of them says, this thing will catch on fire. And the other one says, let's get out of here. They undid the safety belt and went out over the wires. He told us that, and he says, it couldn't have done that. He says, what bent that strut out there, the aileron strut that goes between the aileron, was bent down. They had gone out over the wires. We didn't have no propeller, any torque propeller, and that meant we had to pull it out of there. Well, of course, we got it pulled out and down, took the wings off, the tail section off, with two forces through the fuselage, wired the wings and the tail section into the airplane itself, which still made a pretty wide trailer and put the tail skid into the spare tire rack of 34 Ford that we were using as a chase car, you might say. And we hauled that thing through Eubank, down Somerset, Parker's Lake, across the ferry at uh, Crumlin Falls to uh, uh, Middlesbrough, where they had a hangar. Well, we couldn't haul very fast, of course, and that thing was not built to travel on the road. Those were old clincher type tires. Well, the road from Eubank to Eubank, it had, it was dirt, and it had chug holes in it where it looked like it was there for we would drop clear down in it. We really made no speed at all on that and couldn't. And one, well, one curve, we had to get out and get timbers and jack airplane around because the road wasn't wide enough. The airplane was going to cut across country going around the curve. It was just that sharp. Another one where we had to line up with a, a bridge, and you had to be right with the bridge because the boards were rotted out on the side of where you traveled, and the airplane didn't travel where the car did. So we had to jack it to one side and the other to get it across the bridge. It was interesting. It took all day. We got all, well, we got to uh, Crumlin Falls, and the ferry at Crumlin Falls had a fairly steep approach like all of them did. Well, we were all three sitting in the front seat, and there was just barely room for three people in the front seat of the cars. So uh, I got out. I started down at the ferry, and the ferryman looked at it and said, What do you got back there? And Mr. Jones said, Got an airplane. He said, I don't believe that thing will go on here. Oh, yeah, it'll go on here. So, okay, he pulled on. I guided the little guy to where he could front wheel just barely on the end of the ferry, and the airplane just made it. And Mr. Jones said, does it make it? And I said, I thought you said you knew it would. He said, I've never had an airplane cross here before, but it looked like it would. Well, he was right. So then we started pulling toward the road for a while. The road pretty crooked. And one place, I guess it put a little side strain on a tire or something, because that tire jumped off. And I think it hung clear up a tree. Well, we went on, on the rim and didn't have far to go. When we got to Middlesbrough, before dark, we took the wing panels off on the one side that were damaged and we put them on top of the car. And this was a four-door sedan. Put them on top of the car and tied them down and we drove to Clinton with those wing panels on top. Well, that week, we rebuilt those wing tips. And the next Sunday morning, 
We took Sunday paper with us, and little guy and I took off the middle foot. Now, we weren't driving very fast because we had those things up on top, and there was very little traffic back then. So he was driving, again, I say this airplane automobile was not very wide across the seat. So I was sitting there reading the funny paper, and I got through it, and he said, let me read it. Okay, so I put my foot over on the throttle, and I could reach the wheel very easily from where I was sitting. So I, and we were traveling not too fast anyway, but people looked at us mighty funny when they passed us here with wing panels on top of them reading the funny paper. We got to, to Middleborough, and the wing panels are not heavy, so we got them set up, and we got everything except the final rigging, where you adjust it so it'll fly true. That's where I learned to do it, was watching him. So he tuned them up with this wire tightening up and that when they're on turnbuckles. And we test topped it and worked night, and then we put the stick through the wings. Now, uh, there's a stick through the wires where they cross. I've always seen them and didn't know why it was there, but he showed us. When you take off and fly without those, those wires look like they're about an inch thick. They vibrate. When you put the stick in them, and it makes that much uh, drag, when you put the stick in them, they don't vibrate. And that's the reason it's taped in there. I finally learned a little bit now. So when he came up there, well, he rigged it, test after and everything was fine again. So, yes, it was an from something. I wish now I had kept that propeller. Never thought of it at the time, just junk. So all I had to do was just put it in the car and bring it home. And I wish now I had it. It would have made a beautiful clock to hang on the wall. Because it had quite a story with it. It was an interesting time. Mr. Jones was instructing up until he was 80 years old. He was here. Well, every time he came to Danville, he had his, his father lived here, and uh, his father, when he was 70 years old, married a 21-year-old woman. So she still lives here. We're still friends. I see her every now and then. But every time he came up, he'd stay with his father, Mr. F.I. Jones, who, who lived down on 4th Street where the Chevrolet garage parking lot is now. It was a white frame house. Well, every time he came to town, he called me. Usually I'd take him back out to the airport the next day. And... One day he told me, he says, I want you to see my seven pasture ironica. Seven pastures? I said, you never have a seven pasture airplane. And he laughed. So I took him out there the next morning. Sure enough, there was an ironica tandem. I said, seven pasture? He said, yeah, there was a kid here and a kid here and a kid there. So many in the baggage rack. He had six kids in there with him at one time. So, yes, he did a beautiful job of flying. Uh, on his 80th birthday, he was presented with a lot of certificate signed by the governor and what I don't know who else. He told me that they had passed a law in the Tennessee legislature that he could fly any place, any time. He was the last burn home. He had the privilege. He didn't have to file a fight plan or anything else. He could fly any place at any time. And as far as I know, he's the only one that ever had that. He was proud of it, and he should have been. Well, after his 80th birthday, and he showed all the certificates, chunks and out the or went out to Othus to see those. That was his stepmother. He was up here a year or two after that. He was about 82, and then when he was 83, and he was still flying, still in good physical shape. And he had, this was his one, two, three, fourth wife. He married her when he was about 55, and she was 21. She was from Clinton. And they had two boys. Now, I don't know those two boys. I never was around them. So, that's a fat part of the family I didn't know, but she was up here with him when he came. And I asked about flying, and he said, yes, and I'm still, I'm still uh, giving instruction, but it's actually what it amounts to is somebody wants my name on their log book. Mm -hmm. So, yes, he was still flying. Another time, oh, back in the 50s, I was up at a shop. I heard somebody hooping and yelling. I looked down my front gate, and there was an antique bus pulling in. It had the little porch across the back, like they had in the middle 30s. And he was just hooping and yelling. I had no idea who it was. He pulled it up behind the shop, and it was Mr. Jones and uh, Bertha, his last wife. And he had rigged this thing up as a traveling thing. He had a toilet in it. He had a bed. Now, I don't mean built in. All this stuff was sitting loose in that bus. Oh, yes, he was a very interesting character. Hmm. Little guy course was an excellent pilot. He went into twin engine instruction, which is a little different than single engine, I found out. But uh, that was his, what he was assigned to. He, of course, made a good name for himself, and he went in early enough to where 
he had a pretty fair amount of rank. The instructors do not build up rank like anyone else, like a combat personnel. You just don't. They used to laugh at the fighters and says, all you do is get promoted, so you'll be an uh, element man when you'll be behind your leader. So you just pull up and fire a few rounds, and then you can be element leader until somebody else behind you does the same thing. But uh, he was a major. When the war was over, he flew, well, he and his first wife, Mary Munn, split up. He's the one that he dated all the way through high school. And they had one boy, I believe it was. They split up. And he went to Germany on the Berlin airlift, and he met a man, a girl named Mary from Hopkinsville, I believe it was. She was with the Red Cross, lay married. I met her. She was here several times. Then later he was sent to Formosa, and he was, I think, more in a command position because uh, he was not pilot on this transport that flew into the mountain with him. There were 14, uh, 14 of them on the airplane, 14 or 16, and they couldn't separate. So they're all buried at uh, Arlington. And Mr. Jones went up there. I didn't go up there. I called Mr. Jones and talked to him, but uh, I didn't go. How, what all planes have you flown? Well, all of them in order. <laughs> just, just about. Uh, all of them practically were military planes. I did a little civilian flying, but not the mountain thing. It wasn't a time period where you could. I took my sister riding out here at the airport when I was home on leave once. Uh, we trained on PT 18s, which was Stearman's. We went from there to BT 9s at Randolph Field, who those BT 9s had more flying time for airplane than most pilots ever have. You'd stall one of them and you didn't know whether he was going to stall to the right or the left because they were not perfectly in line. They were good training planes. They were rugged. We learned to even instruments on them. Then in, round, in uh, Brooksville, where I took advance, we flew AT-6s and BC-1. BC-1 was a basic combat one. It had a gun in it, I think, and a little different radio. AT-6s were, were basic planes for our training. When I got out of there, of course, graduated and flew 052s. I might have flew them, thank you. Then when I went to uh, this other squadron, flying uh, sub patrol through 047s and Cubs, L4s. I love those L4s. I had a ball with those things. We had a lot of spare time. We didn't have enough airplane. So I was flight leader in it, and I'd fly them when I had nothing else to do. I wasn't married. I was down there myself, so I had a ball with it. Then uh, left there, went to... Went from Salem and got checked out on P-40. Now, that's a P-40F that had a packet built Merlin engine. It had a little different habits than the others. As you fly that airplane, it's at cruising speed. You're turning about 2280, I think it was. And it had an overtone through the gearbox. And you go, yeah, 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 the whole time you're flying it. That's the one I read. That model. But it had been sabotaged, I found out later. So really, I can't be too fussy about it. At least I got a, I got a little head injury out of it, which may explain a whole lot of things. Then we went to England. We got checked out on P30, P39s. We flew them to North Africa. That was a seven hour and 40 minute flight. Uh, we had P39s in combat. We got P51s. After we were off combat, we had a one P38. And I got checked out in it. I got about three or four hours flying it. I thought I was a hot pilot, you know. I got up there and pulled one throttle back, and I found out you do barrel rolls when you pull one throttle back. That's the way you learn. Um, in the meantime, I was flying P-43 for about maybe two or three hours. That was a mean airplane to fly, or to land. It was the forerunner of the 47. I flew P-47. Then the L-1, the L-4, L-5. Those were nice flying airplanes. Uh, UC-61 and UC-78, they were twin-engine, Cessnas, we used to call them double-breasted cubs because they were fairly light airplanes and they were just utility-type airplanes. That's what I flew in England when I took the Reverend or the pastor up to Burton on the trench to get some chaplain supplies and things like that. That's usually what I flew for that. I got checked out in the Tiger Moth. Uh, one of our pilots 
or from another field came in with a tiger moth to have the mechanics check it over. So I asked him about it. I said, I'd like to check out in that airplane for you if you got time. He said, certain. I'll be here a couple of days. He said, you test type it. I've never sat my bottom in one of them. So I went out there and talked to the mechanics and the mechanic went with it. We test type it. We took about an hour flight. There's no air aerobatics or anything like that. And it has an opposite torque. Now on the fighters, when we take off in them, like they have a lot of power. We would use full right rudder and quite often had to tap our brake to stay on the runway until we got moving pretty good because of the torque. Well, this is not much torque on this little engine, but it's opposite side. The Spitfire was opposite. The British engine turned different. I would have loved to flown a Spitfire and never had an opportunity to. I have a little bit of time on a B-25. I had a little bit of time on a B-18. That was one of the meanest and the hardest flying airplanes I ever sat in was a B-18. Luckily, they were never used for much of anything. So, there was 15 airplanes, up at, types of airplanes that we found up at uh, Dayton that I had flown. So, I mean, that's nice, yes, to look back at, but back then, all of us were what you might say, just cookie cutter pilots. We all had exactly the same training. We all knew exactly what to expect of each other. In formation flying, we knew exactly what the man next to us was going to do. It was just, we were all practically the same. Of course, each one of us had habits, but we all flew exactly the same way. We all took off at the same speed. We landed at the same speed. That's the way our instructions were. How long were you in New Orleans with O47? About three months, something like that. We really had no trouble as far as airplanes down over the Gulf. Now, we did have one, oh, the squadron that was there before us had B-18s. B-18 pretty good sized airplane. And one of them had engine trouble and went down in the Gulf. And you know, there were so much things that were surveyed that must have been on that airplane that they couldn't account for that it could have never gotten off the ground. Blankets, guns, I guess it's the first chance they had to clear their supplies of what they didn't have on record. We were in 047, we had excellent mechanics. I've seen bailing wire on those airplanes where they didn't have the right parts to fasten them together, but the mechanics knew what they were doing. They kept them in excellent shape. We only had six. We didn't have enough to where we had personal cross countries or anything like that because there just wasn't enough airplanes. And they were not a fast airplane. Built in North America, they were beautiful airplanes to fly. They had about four hours of fuel. If you landed one in the water, it would float as long as you needed for it to float. There was one that hit the Mississippi River. We were told, and we read the flight reports on these things, so of course it was part of our survival technique. We had a three-man raft on it, three or four-man raft. And it was right where we could get to it. The wings were sealed in that one of them made a crash landing in the middle of the Mississippi River. Now why, I don't know. The banks on each side looked like he could make some land, but some way he landed in the Mississippi River. Well, they went out there and they got them off. They pulled the airplane to the bank and they tied it off. It floated. About two hours later, somebody says, well, why don't we take this to the other side where there's a ramp and get out? They pulled it over over the motorboat, put the wheel, the pilot cranked the wheel down, they pulled it out with a tractor for four hours. So yes, we had a good opportunity to get away from those airplanes. But we never had any trouble. We, well, one thing, well, one trip that I was on, they were taking some pictures and it was for publicity more than anything else. Well, it happened that the photographer, it was a military photographer, was in the airplane that I was flying wingman to. And then it wasn't because I was pretty or anything like that, it's just because I happened to be there. And like I said, we all flew the same way. So coming back over the swamps, we usually didn't fly over maybe 15 feet high, because what's the difference between any which you were going in? So here we were flying along about 20 feet, and he signaled me to stay still. I stayed absolutely straight and level, and he moved over close to me, and I've got some of those pictures. I came out pretty good on them. The one trouble we did have with an airplane was there were, we normally flew two airplanes. We flew way out, uh, quite often out of sight of land. And never spotted a submarine, but they said one thing is they can spot you before you can see them. What we would do if we saw one, I don't know. We had 130 caliber firing in the wing, 130 caliber firing backwards, and they had us outclassed on guns. They could have shot us out of the sky with a submarine before we could have gotten them. So we were told, said, just fly around them and call a Coast Guard with radio. Those things had excellent radio. 
So, there was an airplane, a flight took off down there one day, beautiful day, and it was a lieutenant colonel, who was a wing commander, flying the lead ship, our crews and our pilot and other one. There was a tanker down there that was sticking with his nose out, and they'd been burned about two weeks. They'd been hit by submarines. And as they came in, the lead man, this lieutenant colonel, circled that airplane. Well, as he gave the throttle again to take back out, his wingman went forward on the throttle and the arm came off the throttle in his hand, in the pilot's hand. He looked back at his wing as his second man, his observer, and showed him a throttle and moved forward. Now the second man had dual controls. They were not complete, but he did have dual controls. He could have pushed his throttle forward. Well, he didn't get the message. He was not a pilot. He didn't have any training in pilot. He didn't get the message. So this, there is an emergency procedure for it, which we didn't know until then. We were all taught it right after this. He jammed the stub of that in there to where he could work the throttle forward to where he could fly out of there. So he got up. He got up with the other airplane. The other airplane, of course, was not flying fast. He was leaned over looking at his wing tanks because the wing tanks gauges were right beside the seat down on the floor. And he hit a pelican. It came through the windshield. There was no armor flash on that airplane. It came through the windshield hit the observer right square in the face. Of course, he didn't have goggles, anything on for protection, didn't expect it. Well, it filled his face up with glass, blood, feathers, and made a stinking mess out of the airplane. Well, when this first happened, let me back up a little bit. When this first happened, and the pilot showed this, the, the second man, his observer, the throttle, the gunner misunderstood. Now, they didn't know this right then. And the gunner thought he said bail out and out he went. Lo! Well, the pilot, of course, was taking care of his throttle and stuff. Nobody saw the observer or the wingman. So they, uh, something was said about the other airplane. They said, You got no gunner. He looked back there and the man was gone. It, what? How, is this, this in that plane? Yeah, and the one with the, the throttle off. Three people in the plane? Yeah, the oh. gunner was the third man. He rode okay. backwards. And, Normally, he wasn't seeing what went on. So he had bailed out right after they had circled this thing down there, and the pilot came up with that truck. So they went back, and they couldn't find him. It's awfully hard to see a man in the water. So they went on home, and that's when the uh, lieutenant colonel hit the... Luckily, he wasn't up. He was head down and hit the pelican. They got home, and they landed the airplane, and of course, here comes the Hamlet out to pick up the one that had his face full of glass and uh, here everybody was sad face because they'd lost a gunner who of course this was all what you'd say a family group almost. The next flight that went down there while well, they flew over that area and they saw a fishing boat saw a couple of men wave at them that's all it was. Well the man showed up to o'clock at that night. Called in. He didn't get back there till about supper. But he hit the water quick. He pulled his parachute just as soon as he got out of the airplane. He knew what to do. He hit the water and pulled his May West, like he should have. It was, well, this was, this was the last flight of the day because they saw him the next morning. It got dark and he was in the water, floating. Didn't know where he was or anything else. Somewhere during the night, his feet hit the bottom and he walked up on the shore. He got up there and sat out on the beach. And he knew the beaches were deserted. There was no place he could walk to. So about daylight, a fishing boat went by and he flagged them down. They were picking him up when our flight went over. And he waved at them. Of course, they didn't know who he was. He didn't even have his parachute or anything. And then about 2 o'clock, the men said, we're going fishing. You go fishing with us and then we'll take you home. So they did. So they got him back in and about 2 o'clock he called in and of course he got back with us. But the man that got hit in the face, they took him to the hospital and they picked glass and stuff out of his face and he got by fine. It didn't even hurt his eyes. He got by very lucky. So that was one of the exciting things. Back to the throat. You don't cut off just a minute. South Africa, early, we had fair air superiority, but the Germans had a lot of airplanes. The Stukas were dive bombers that were used in the early days of the Germans fighting, but they were not airplanes that could defend themselves too well. They were strictly for dive bombing. They had a squadron of them passed over us on one of our missions where we flew right on the ground. We looked up and there were Stukas. We called the fighters and we had an escort of 12, uh, uh, 12 Spitfires escorting us to see that we were not interfered with. They thought we were pretty important. 
So they dropped down on these Stukas, and I don't think any of the Stukas got away. A Spitfire could outrun it at cruising speed, so they had a field day with them. As far as I know, that was the last Stukas were ever used. I've seen them on the ground. I know how to build. The pilot sits in an armored seat. The gunner behind him has nothing, no protection. But maybe that's the way they wanted it. We were on a mission over German lines with four of us. As we came back out, until we crossed the line, we didn't pull back up off maybe 10, 15 feet altitude. We were flying low, and all at once we realized we were looking into revetments of German airplanes, fighters, 109. They were hidden, well hidden. The field, you couldn't locate the field, or these revetments just looked like bunches of trees. Of course, immediately we reported it, and they had bombers and they even had fighters in on them, I think, that same afternoon. But that was part of our job, just to report such things. The, after, well, there was a hill that was towards the south of Tunis. It was called Zagwan, and it stood up by itself. And any time we flew past that hill, Zagwan was the name of it, we picked up our heavy, quite a bit of anti-aircraft fire. We used to laugh about it because we'd stay out of their range. After the African campaign was over, we got some re replacement pilots. And about, oh, a couple of days after the Tunisian campaign was over, I was on a, recon on a practice mission to show one of these new pilots, his name was Ben Emmert, to show him the area. We went over Tunis. And as we looked down at the field at Tunis, there were a lot of shot up airplanes, a lot of bomb marks. There was an American or two American transports on the field. 39 was like running a tricycle. You could see out of them very well. They handled nice on the ground. So I called Ben and I said, Ben, can you land on that field? He says, I can where you lead me. So we picked us out a spot where it was clear, long enough. We dropped it in and we taxied over where there were a bunch of German airplanes. There was a guard there. We talked to the guard. He said, do not touch any of the airplanes in this area where I'm guarding. He says, those sitting right over there behind me, you can have anything you want from them. We had time and we had a pair of pliers and a screwdriver, which I carried in my pocket. We went over on those airplanes. A lot of them were shot well, torn up. A lot of them had been used for parts, things like that. And we pick up as much as we could carry of engine instruments, controls, anything we could get off the airplane, gun sights, stuff like that. We take them to our airplanes, and there wasn't a lot of room in a P-39, about four inches on each side of the seat. We filled up both P-39s as much as we could. We thanked the guard. We took off in our little airplanes. We flew back, and as soon as my crew chief hit the airplane, I says, get everything you can out of here. I told him what was there. He says, I'll take care of it. Of course, there was no secret to it. Everybody knew what we'd done. So after everything was unloaded, our crew chief brought it down to our tent. Well, there was a few items that I wanted. There was an altimeter that was practically new. There was a gun sight. There were several other things I wanted, but you know we carry so much. So I picked up what little stuff I wanted. My crew chief, my armament man, got all the rest of it. It was good trading material for them. And Ben Emmer did the same with his. I still have quite a bit of that stuff here yet. It should be in a museum someplace. Towards the end of the, of the battle, of North Africa, the Germans were trying very hard to resupply their troops. They sent in from Italy and Sicily Ju-52s, which are tri-motors, strictly transport airplanes. They're not any way combat airplanes at all, although they have been used carrying bombs and a few things like that, but not really combat airplanes. Our fighters located them, and they had a field day, coming back, get ammunition, get fuel, and get back up and shoot down some more Ju-52s. They had a day's job right there. How many they brought down, I don't know. That'd be in the history books. Another thing that was interesting to watch for us, and we were told everything was coming up, there would be a mass attack on the island of Pantelleria, which was off the coast of Tunisia. They were going to capture it by air, which they did in one day. Now, we were not involved. But several of us would take our little P-39s, fly out there, and stay out of range, out of the way, and sat there and watch as much of it as we could. It was an interesting show, again, that part of history. When the African campaign was over, uh, everything quit, and there we sat. I had a tent mate named 
A.B. Einstein, he was from North Dakota. And we had been tent mates practically during the whole campaign. He was shot down during the last days of the campaign. There were two airplanes, P-51, sent in on a certain valley to locate artillery emplacements that the Germans had. They went down low range. He got hit, caught on fire. He pulled it up, just straight up as near as he could, rolled it over on his back, pulled his canopy, went out. It burned his legs, it burned around his arms, and it burned some little bit around his face. But he got out of it, came out by parachute, and he landed in the middle of the gun emplacements. Germans picked him up and took him down in a revetment, protected, and within an hour, the Americans shelled that outfit. Luckily, he wasn't hit, but they did do some damage to the Germans, but they shelled right where he was. They got him to, <coughs> the Germans took him to Tunis to the hospital. And the day after the campaign was over, we got a notice that he was, word that he was in the hospital at Tunis. So, since we were good friends, the flight off the flight surgeon asked me if I would like to go with him and a driver in an ambulance to pick A.B. up. Sure. We went through battlefields that were fresh. They had not been cleaned up any way they were, just like they were left. We got into Tunis, which wasn't bad at damage at all. It's a beautiful city, it was not An old city, history-wise. It's not far from Carthage. We found where we were going, and there were British guards and German guards at the gate around this big hospital. This was a a uh, civilian hospital which but had been taken over. We told them what we wanted, we went in, we talked to a German officer who was still in charge of the hospital, and we told him what we wanted. He said he was taken this morning with an ambulance with a pilot from the 31st fighter group who were on the field with us. So we came back empty. And when we got back to the field, Avery was there. He spent one night there and then to a hospital because of his burns. He was not seriously hurt. I heard from him for 30 years after that ever Christmas. He died about two years ago. Ah, see, after the Afghan campaign was over, they pulled us back to Orleans, and a whole couple of months after that, I came back to the States as an instructor. Came back to the States, they told us we wouldn't be back overseas, settled down. Three months later, got married. Three months after that, back in England. So it was never a dull moment. It was interesting. What else do you want on this? The uh, plowing through the city. The, what? the tank plowing. Oh, little town. <clears throat> when I was in the tank outfit in France, one thing that made an impression on me was the little town of Rancy, France. It's one of the beautiful old time towns. I don't know how big. It has a big city square, and the buildings around it are just like you see in the old, old pictures. They're beautiful. The whole streets, or what we could see of it, and the square was filled with vehicles and bodies. The tank dozer had gone through there and opened a path through the middle of it. I've seen automobiles mashed down just like you step on a kid's tin toy, mashed absolutely flat where the tanks had run over the top of it. Outside of Ronsi, there were for miles there, it seemed like on every side road and road itself, vehicles and soldiers. The soldiers were all dead. There were no living soldiers that I saw. The Air Force had had the opportunity to come in there and was told to come in there and clean them out to see what they could do. That's what the tank force told them. And they did a good job with the help of the tank force cleaning everything out. I don't know how many, but horse-drawn artillery. They had vehicles I had never seen in any identification manual, and we studied that because we needed it. On down south of there, uh, we were in convoy, and I had to use my radio the whole time I was in convoy. But uh, we passed a field, well, where there were some German dead. I don't know the story, but there were several German dead in a field. It was a crossroad where we stopped for a little while. I saw a French family come by. This is elderly people, all of them in wooden shoes. And it looked like Daddy's family looked up and pointed the German and says, Bon Bosch. I knew what he meant. In North Africa, after the African campaign was over, I saw a field of German prisoners. This was something like a five-acre field full of prisoners. It was after, as these prisoners got on a train, it's probably the same ones that I saw later, 
One of them's a great big man, and my friends around me laughed and said, Boy, what a target. How did he get away from this part with it? But he evidently made it. North Africa campaign was interesting in that it was a much smaller uh, procedure than France. France was over a big area. In North Africa, I knew a lot of the people that flew in other areas, even from where I did. In France, I never, in England and France, I never went on an air base that I didn't see somebody that I knew. Now that sounds like I knew about an Air Force. I didn't, but at the time I graduated, so many men that I graduated with had gotten up into positions where they were still there. One of my flight, one of my friends from flying school, when I first went back to England the second trip, he was in charge of the 12th Observation Squadron, which I was with in, uh, before I went into flying school. His name was Woodrow. He was a Lieutenant Colonel Cadet Commander in my class. I talked to him, I talked to the flight leaders and the, not the engineering officer, but the all of the men under him, down to the flight leaders, were my classmates in flying school. I asked him about transferring into the outfit, and he told me he would like to have me, but he couldn't put me ahead of his men because I had had combat experience. He couldn't, I could understand that. His men would have to go ahead of me. So I did meet people every place I went. One I met was a sergeant who was a hangar sergeant in charge of the hangar at Fort Knox, who I worked under. I was a scientist. Here I got to England, second trip. I go in a place and there he is, and I said, hello, Sergeant. He was the first lieutenant. Well, he was married and settled down, so was I. We went to London together and different things like that. Neither one of us lived a wild life, but he was one who was well settled down. We both enjoyed going to England or London and seeing the sights, which we did. Billy Pitts was another one. He and I ran around a lot of different places, but again, we didn't live wild. We went more to see the sights. Tower of London was the most interesting thing I saw. And it makes you remember dates of history. What else do you need? That's the end of the tape. Yeah, we'll get that out of tape. Yeah. It's everything I can think of off hand. Shows one minute. Hmm. Well, that gets me pretty well unloaded, too. Recorded for posterity. Maybe not too good. It's not a step there I never told. <laughs>